If you're just logging in, we're just waiting for our guest speaker today. Layla's coming. She's logging in right now. All right. We're just waiting. I think a few more people should log in. But in the meantime, I will, for those of you who are here, I will um, introduce myself. I'm Zaina. I uh, have the privilege of having a Synergy Plus Physical Therapy Pilates Studio in Marin in San Rafael and Allegra works with me there. And Layla actually was working in the same office space with us. Um, she's a great, she's a fantastic woman, fantastic acupuncturist. And so I've brought her in today to just answer some questions to help us make some connections between what we do as movement professionals and what she can do to help or what acupuncture can do to help in the process of healing. So I wanted to, I know a few more people are already going to be logging in, so I wanted to wait for them, but maybe we will get going a little bit. I put my puppy outside, but if we hear whining, <laughs> he's not being <laughs> abused. He's actually just outdoors. So anyway, yeah. um, well, you and I have shared a, a couple of patients and um, yes. that I think yeah. worked really, really well um, uh, from mm -hmm. my stance. And I love, um, I love everything to do with strengthening, fortifying, you know, keeping, keeping yourself in good shape, um, in, in learning how to engage the muscles that, you know, we so often forget, right. Um, mm -hmm. sitting the way we are doing what we have to do. So, um, yeah, so I guess I could talk a little bit about yeah. what, well, tell um, us, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your journey, how you ended up with acu doing acupuncture or how, the, how did you choose that? Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, I've had a couple of careers. This isn't the, um, the first one, but, um, I've always been somebody who's really been in tune with what's going on with my body. Um, not necessarily an athlete, but always kind of, a, you know, feeling and knowing what's going on. Um, I actually got into, uh, acupuncture because I was impressed by the allergy treatment that I received. Um, but also how wonderful I felt with, um, with just having regular acupuncture treatment. So, um, there's a couple of reasons for that. And we can talk about it a little bit later. Um, I went to, so once I felt really impressed and I, my allergies were better and I was feeling really good. I was like, you know, what is this? And I actually, um, was living 10 minutes away from an acupuncture school that uh, had an open house. And, and I just kind of, from one thing to another, I um, decided to enroll. Um, it's a four year program in the United States that um, for us, it was uh, four years with sort of round the clock um, around the year. We had two weeks off break every three months. Um, we had to study anatomy and physiology um, as prerequisites. And then um, the course was, you know, based on uh, safety, understanding the whole system of how things work in Chinese medicine, and, um, you know, also our clinic hours and working with, uh, with patients under supervision. So um, it was a great program. Um, I loved it. Um, it didn't have orthop orthopedics um, particularly uh, in that element. And so I went on later and um, took additional classes with um, an orthopedic uh, specialist, acupuncturist, who actually was one of the first acupuncturists to work on uh, athletes in the 1980s, uh, the Olympic athletes. So, um, so Anyway, so that's a little bit about what I've been doing. I've been doing it ever since. Um, I love it. It's my last career, <laughs> let's say. Yeah. So, yeah. That's great. Well, I think what would be really useful for us is to know how like, we have a lot of clients that come in. Mm -hmm. We um, sometimes they need more than just the movement therapy that we're providing sometimes. And so we often refer them out as a Pilates instructor, or even as a physical therapist, mm -hmm. uh, we refer them out for conjunctive treatments that might be helpful. So could you give us an idea 
what um, it, in an orthopedic, mostly orthopedic issue, oh. I would say, because some are not only orthopedic, um, but maybe an inflammatory condition or what, what conditions do you think acupuncture could be most helpful for or what kind of client seems to benefit the most? Well, you know, that is, I mean, okay, let's be simple. A <laughs> healthy, young, athletic client who has a minor athletic, you know, uh, complaint is going to respond just, I'm sure the way it is and with, you know, PT and because, you know, and Pilates is that they're already in great shape. They just need a little extra to, to uh, push them over the edge to wellness, right. To being back to wellness. So um, I would say, you know, most anybody can benefit. It's how, you know, how are you going to go about it? So let's take, um, I was just thinking about um, something like uh, trigeminal neuralgia, that's one area where, um, or even, you know, just simple TMJ, uh, can, um, can really respond greatly with, um, acupuncture. It's not easy to sometimes, um, you know, work, uh, with the mouth. Right. And so using, um, either points around the jaw or even on the acupuncture meridian channels distal to the jaw can really help loosen up the area. Um, we've, uh, I like to work on elders who have uh, osteoarthritis in the knee. Um, if it's not a meniscal tear or something like that, um, simple knee arthritis can respond super, super well to, um, to acupuncture and a little bit of electrical stimulation. Um, we do a lot of, I don't know, something like, um, even a low back pain could be, um, something that acupuncture can work on from the front of the body. Um, because there might be of actually some inflammation of the gut that that's, you know, then referring pain. And so it's really interesting to just see how, you know, we have to do a good intake, like I'm sure, you know, everybody does and kind of get to the root of the problem, but, um, there's lots of candidates for acupuncture. Yeah. And would, uh, I, I have the sense that it really works well in inflammatory conditions. Osteoarthritis is one of those. So maybe in conjunction with some movement practice, would you say that treatment, my impression is that after you've had acupuncture, you're not really going to want to go out and do a movement therapy right away after, right. Right? If, if anything, it should be flip-flopped or maybe not at the same day or the same time. Yeah. yeah you know, there's different, there's different. Um, so let's just talk about the different ways that you can do acupuncture because there's not one uh, only style of acupuncture that exists. So um, the acupuncture that I learned, let's say from the orthopedic, uh, acupuncturist teacher, um, was a, an acupuncture really oriented towards, um, musculoskeletal zones. So, um, you could take that and, for, and also working with sometimes with trigger points, um, uh, as well as motor points. So if you're going in that approach, um, and somebody is coming in and wants to optimize, you know, like have a better workout, right. And they've, they've done their workout and then, yeah, you might stimulate some motor points and then they go for a run and then you come, they come back and you see how it went, etc. If they are recovering from an injury, and we need to just lower the inflammation and, you know, maybe deal with the stress of, of it was, if it was a physical, you know, physical trauma or whatever, then no, you're probably not going to want to go out and um, do your regular workout right afterwards. So um, if you're working on a person in a, in a sort of global manner, and by the way, they have low back pain. Yeah. You're going to want to rest after your treatment, maybe do your workout, do your exercise before. So if you're working with um, a physical therapist or a Pilates instructor, you know, you just get on the same page about what the goal is, right? 
the goal of uh, the end goal. Uh, we're all working towards, you know, uh, a deeper understanding of what the issue is. I know Pilates is all about, you know, and, and of course, PT, it's you're working on the root of what is creating the imbalance and, and therefore, you know, the goal is going to be the same. So I would say that's a simplistic ex expl explanation, but hopefully helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And how many clients, uh, how many times do people usually have to come in for acupuncture? I know that's probably a very loaded question, but if yeah. you could give a couple examples of I, what it might take. Sure. If you're doing like, let's say somebody's doing um, like an osteoarthritis knee, uh, knee treatment um, and you're an elder, uh, elderly patient, um, I would say it's good to jumpstart with uh, maybe at least two times a week for about three weeks and then um, reevaluate and see if, you know, see how they're doing and then maybe go back to once a week for another three weeks. It may not completely eliminate um, the pain, but it could get it to a really low level. Um, the patients that I worked on, um, would come in weekly. And, um, sometimes then they would go off, you know, this was, I had an elderly patient who was a great hiker and she would come in weekly for, uh, a couple months. And then she would go off on her hike and she'd be like, well, you know, I got myself to this really good stage. Every, all the inflammation came down. I wanted to go do my hike and then she would come back. So, um, for something more acute, you might want to do every other day you know, uh, once the swelling has gone down and you really want to maybe work with elect electrical stimulation around a tendon or something, if you have that possibility to work on it every day for every other day for a week and then go to biweekly, you know, treat uh, treatments. Yeah. So it does, it depends on the case, but yeah, it seems like the more severe cases or more acute cases would, would yeah. benefit from more treatment up front Definitely. and then do you usually recommend the sort of maintenance program after, or do people just go off and do their thing no. and then they don't need it anymore? Or? I do. I do. I tend, I mean, the way it tends to happen is that there's um, a maintenance might be once every three months, if they just want to come in for sort of mm -hmm. full rebalancing, it could be monthly. I tend to find that the, my most regular patients have one issue and then that gets better. And then maybe something else comes up and they come back and they say, Hey, can we work on this now? Um, so it really depends on the, the type. I don't, um, I mean, of course, I think it's wonderful, but does it have to be that way? I think once every three months, if you get three, four times a year, if you're perfectly healthy and you have nothing going on and no aches and pains, that's, that'll be great for you. Uh, maybe once at every change of the season, you know, um, mm -hmm. So, but, um, like I said, I have, uh, patients who can come in because they've had knee pain, but then now it's a shoulder pain or, you know, if they're typically athletic and they're out doing a lot of things, things happen. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the, one of my favorite things about acupuncture that I think resonates a lot with, with Pilates actually, and uh, movement and people who are looking at a whole is that we're looking at a whole body, right? I, and, right? and I say Pilates physical therapists, I think for the most part should be looking at the whole body, but are sometimes really focused in on that one injury site. Whereas I think honestly in the Pilates world, we're a lot more open to being able to look at the whole body from head to foot. We're looking at alignment. We're looking at posture. We're, we're looking at changing, using our exercise practice to change habits over time. And I feel like acupuncture and Pilates are similar in that way, because I think acupuncture, like we, we so, so far have just been talking about, okay, what do we do with, with an orthopedic? But I think it's much broader than that, right? You're, it's like mm -hmm. a system approach. So, um, and I know a little bit about it, but maybe you could tell us a little bit more when you're looking at somebody, even with an orthopedic injury, my guess is that you're not looking at just that orthopedic injury. You're looking at a lot of other things. What are some of those other things? I think it's super interesting. So I'm uh, curious about what those yeah. other things are that you're looking oh my goodness. at and for. I open a can of worms. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but all sorts of things. I mean, it's really, um, so 
you know, the, the system of Chinese medicine is it's has its own diagnostic um, criteria. Um, one of the things we, so we can, you know, and, and let's say we're taking an orthopedic patient because most, to be honest, the orthopedic patients that come in, I will work on that specific complaint, but I'm also, like you said, treating the whole person. Um, because why not? We can, and 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 what I do. Um, so one of the things we look at. Um, let me just put it more in 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 uh, movement therapy terms. Is we look a lot in Chinese medicine on what is strong and what is not strong, and what we call is excess and deficient. That's our kind of slope, uh, term. So um, I know. Uh, so for example, if somebody is coming in and. Um, they have uh, knee problems. Um, I might take a look and see, well, what do their legs look like? You know, are, are, and we have zones. Um, I mean, I could use the, the more uh, anatomical uh, terminology, but are the insides of their legs, you know, stronger or are they weaker? Do the outsides, you know, the IT band, all those, does that seem really tight? Does, is one side, you know, too strong on the other sides. And what we do is we work on balancing those channels, which happen to run along uh, the, the tendons and, you know, run and have their own zones that are, you know, for example, we have a, a channel that's the gallbladder channel that runs the whole length of the IT band and then some all the way down to the feet. So you could call them fascial planes, you could call them many different things. So one of the things we look at is what is, what is strong, what is weak, how can we balance that out? So in a knee treatment, um, we would work on the channel that um, is right on the, if, if we saw the inner sides of the, the legs being weak, there are acupuncture points in their channels that um, we work on that end up being, um, you know, muscle motor points that end up strengthening the, the, the muscle and therefore also working on the knee. So you don't just have to go and needle right into the knee. You can um, affect that way. Other things, you know, I would look at is if somebody's coming kind of a classic thing for us in Chinese medicine is um, somebody coming in with low back pain. So low back pain can be due to so many things as you know, and of course strengthening. So we could be seeing, well, you know, what is that maybe, maybe that person has an inflamed gut and working on, you know, not only needling in that area, but helping their, their gut improve could give them uh, a little bit more um, energy to then do their abs, to then not feel so shut down in that area. And then um, that would therefore strengthen. And so working on the gut, we don't have to needle right there. We can needle distally, can needle in different areas. So there's many ways of kind of looking and seeing, um, what's going on and treating the whole person. Um, you know, low back pain could even be from uh, uh, some sort of um, like, uh, what do you call it? Um, gynecological uh, complaints. And so acupuncture can treat that and that definitely doesn't have to be uh, a local treatment. So, so that's one of the ways, yeah. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the fascial lines because I find that in the treatments that I've had with uh -huh. you, I found yeah. that it seemed a lot of the times that you were actually, if I was going to have to name it in a very non-Chinese medicine type of way, I would have said, well, that's my fascial line or that's sort of my back fascial line or that's my lateral fascial line that you're working on um, or even the cross fascia across the abdomen or across the, the thoracolumbar fascia that's going in diagonals down and across. It seems like a lot of those points follow those fascial lines, um, which I think we, we had actually uh, several weeks ago, a discussion about biotensegrity and the fascial planes and the fascial lines. And I think that that um, we're learning so much more about how wound up and how much they, when they're dysfunctional, how much they can affect the body. And it just struck me as really interesting that a lot of uh, your I'm sorry if I get it wrong, but I think you called them channels, right? That are running through that yeah. you follow they, are along the fascial planes as well. Completely. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of overlap between um, 
so the zones that run the channels that run over you know with the fascial planes um, a lot of the acupuncture points are actually um, motor points so mm -hmm. right where the nerve enervates the muscle um, and many of the points are where trigger points you know that knot um, which probably, you know, you would even be better placed than I would to, to explain probably is again, linked with the fascial planes that the, that there are a lot of acupuncture points that are classically on areas that are very prone to, to trigger points. So, um, you could take, um, uh, one sort of, um, over in the, in the glutes, uh, what we call, um, you know, down that, that, that everybody kind of has <laughs> pain with their sciatic pain or piriformis pain. And, and that's, that's actually, um, an area that, you know, is, is often congested by, well, there happens to be an acupuncture, you know, like a classical thousand year old acupuncture point that is like, you know, find it. We, we find our, um, our points, um, based on the anatomy of the person. So, um, that, way when we when we learn it classically we learn the anatomy and the physiology terminology but we actually refer to it based on the channel and based on the size of the person so everybody's points um fit them so yeah so yeah so that's uh, yeah no i think there there are many overlaps and i think there's not just one i think it it kind of creates its own bundle yeah mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, I think that's really great. Um, what about there's a lot of herbal therapy that often goes along with acupuncture. And um, can you speak to that a little bit and explain what when that's a good idea or how that's prescribed or how it yeah. might also help? Sure. Um, so in California, where I am licensed, um, we are required to study herbal therapy. Not every acupuncturist um, is required to study uh, herbal therapy. So I would definitely say to just just as a you know disclaimer, those that if you're going to see an herbalist, um, you know just check out what their what their qualifications are. If you're going to see an acupuncturist, um, you know ask them if they have formally studied herbology. I think it's something that um, we, it's real medicine. Um, this, this herbology was, and Chinese medicine was, was around when, when pretty much conventional medicine wasn't there. So it's a, it's a way to treat. So in working with, um, patients, uh, I think herbology is amazing because there are gentle ways to what we say, whisper to the body to help decrease inflammation, um, actually promote blood flow, um, and to, to really help with, um, you know, even, even something such as simple as, um, helping someone sleep with an herbal therapy can, if they can get a couple of those good nights of sleep can then completely reduce the inflammation that they might be having in their body due to the stress of not being able to sleep and the stress of being worried about not being able to sleep and the stress of, everything that goes with it. So um, I think herbal therapies are, um, I mean, you can go anywhere from topical, um, topical plasters, which are messy, but very effective in some ways um, to taking internal um, herbs. There are herbs in our um, Chinese pharmacopoeia that are uh, specifically for tendons and ligaments. So in an orthopedic setting, we tend to use um, those, of course, um, there are herbs that actually what, what we call quicken the blood and move the blood. So once you're maybe past an acute trauma and you're still trying to, to, uh, you know, have that, uh, hematoma go away and kind of get the, um, things there's herbal therapies that you can take for that. Um, and there are herbal therapies that are, um, even indicated for nerve, uh, nerve pain and nerve disorders. So it's a, it's a really, um, complete and thorough medicine. Um, you do have to do a proper intake and discuss, you know, what the goals and what the, and make sure that there's no interactions and that everything is, is going well, but it's a great compliment. It's, it works fantastically. Yeah. 
So great, great. Yeah. Well, um, I wanted to op- take a moment and open the floor to anybody else who might have questions. If you want to, you could unmute yourself and ask a question. If you wanted to send it through on the chat, I could ask Layla the question too. So whichever way. But what questions do you guys have that you might want answered? I know it's it's a uh, it's hard to just sort of all all at once say how how can how can movement therapy and acupuncture work together. But I would just say that you know getting getting on the same page, making sure that the, that the client, you know, expresses to you what their goal is. And then acupuncturist with their kind of diagnoses can, can assist. And then, um, the movement therapy can, you know, can keep the person strong. Right. I definitely believe mm-hmm. acupuncture can help reduce inflammation, can help um, you know, uh, activate the muscles can, can help promote blood flow, but it's not going to keep you strong. Just, you know, keep your muscles strong. That is the work that, that needs to be done by the patient and with, uh, with their licensed or proper, uh, physical therapist. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I'm happy to talk about a specific uh, case. Um, like I said, the the knee, knee pain works really, really well. Jaw pain works really well with acupuncture. Um, needles might be a hindrance for some people. So um, there are other modalities that many acupuncturists do um, no, and that would be moxibustion, which is actually, um, putting a little patch on an, an area of the acupuncture point and, and, um, safely burning, a, what they call mugwort, which is some dried herb. So that actually can be really, really good. That's really warming and really, really promotes blood flow for certain areas. So someone who, like we were saying about, um, strong versus weak, someone who's very, uh, what we call deficient would sometimes be a really great candidate for that. Now it's not something that is commonly, commonly practiced because it has an odor, but it is very traditional and it can be really, really beneficial. So that's, um, that's actually um, one of the treatments that's really good in like cancer patients um, for increasing their white blood counts and things like that. So um, then there's also cupping which I think is practiced in not just Chinese medicine, but is practiced by, you know, physical therapists and everyone else. And that there's um, different, different ways of approaching that, but that's not needle-based and that can be really helpful in um, working along the channels or working down the back or even working on a shoulder or um, so that's another modality. Um, there is a modality. Can I hold you? Sorry, I'm interrupting oh, sure. you. Can I hold you to that a little bit longer on the cupping? Because yeah. I think a lot of people are familiar with it now. Yeah. And um, we, I use it in physical therapy, but when I use it, and I think we have the same goal, obviously, but I think we yeah. use it with a little different intention. And mm-hmm. I'll just explain what I do. Maybe you can explain yeah. what you do just so we can compare. Yeah. I um, When I mostly use cupping for, and I use pressure cups, not heated cups which Mm -hmm. I think um, more in Chinese medicine, they use, well, they use both, I think, but um, I think most physical therapists only use pressure cups. Mm -hmm. And what I usually use it for is helping to, we call it myofascial decompression therapy in California. Um, In California, physical therapists also cannot dry needle, but in other places they can. So this is our only uh, Mm -hmm. modality that we can use that comes even close to the realm. Um, and I, so myofascial decompression, meaning that we take, that we put place the cups on area where we feel like the fascia and the skin and the structures are way too tight to help release. And because I'm very not nice to my clients, sometimes I will follow a fascial line with the cups and then I will have them stretch through that fascial line with the cups on and actually create, for example, would be following the chain from glute Mm -hmm. to hamstring to posterior calf 
right. all the way down to the plantar fascia, like under the calcaneus, the bottom right. of the foot, the plantar fascia. And then I'll let them scooch over to the very edge of the table that they're on so they can kind of lay on their back, give them a strap with that they put on the ball of their foot and ask them to slowly bring the leg up into stretch. So we're continuing that posterior stretch line and then point and flex the foot going in and out of fascial tension and nerve tension at that range. Um, so th that's very not nice of me, but I bet then they, <laughs> I bet they're kind of going, Ooh, this is spicy, right? They feel really good when the cups come off, which yeah. is great. <laughs> So, you know, that's sort of, that's kind of an extreme example of what I might do. Could you, if somebody had um, tightness and pain down either the sciatic pathway or down the fascial chain, plus your fascial chain, but I think your approach would not be quite that. So maybe you could. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I'm honestly, that sounds amazing, Zaina. What, what, I mean, I'm sure at the time it's not super fun, but you know, like you said, when it comes off and the relief that they feel, um, the way cupping is practiced is a little bit more chain, you know, traditional in the, in Chinese medicine, but I would say, that the goal, um, so that it's not so fascially plane oriented. Um, it's often diagnostic, however, and that's, I think, something that's fun to share with, um, with uh, you know, those that may not be aware of it is that the color and the, um, obviously the shape is the same, but the color based on the location can give us a sense of, what the, the severity of the problem. So, and um, so let's take, for example, the way, the way I've learned it is um, let's take your, your cupping um, the upper back. Cause I mean, the most common place for us as Chinese medicine practitioners to cup is the back and maybe the sacrum. Um, I'll talk about the leg in a, in a second, but um, so if, somebody was complaining of neck pain and we decided to cup um, the neck and maybe the upper back a little bit and the traps. Um, if we, and you know, we kind of try and keep the cups close together and, and, and fill in that area as much. If we were to see, let's say you've got someone's back and we've cupped maybe four cups on the neck and then down the back, if we were to see that one side was dark and the other side was not, well, that's your first diagnostic tip where, you know, obviously the side that's colored is going to be where the blood flow isn't flowing as well, where something is going on. Now, perhaps um, you could say, in another case, you could see um, one of the cups on the neck is really dark and then the rest are really light pink, well, then also that sends you to an area of problem. Um, we also say that when there are no colorations and there is pain and we can feel it, that it could be actually related to nerve. So we tend to say that, that uh, muscle, musculus, musculoskeletal muscle specifically problems or you know, whatever the fascial planes, et cetera, that will actually tend to color much more than say nerve issues, nerve pinch, nerves, nerve problems. So that's how we tend to do it. Um, if I were trying to work on a leg with the way I was trained, um, let's say from the glute down, I would do what we call running cupping. So running cupping is then we would, um, add a little bit of, uh, oil or something. And I tend to use the, the suction cups or the pressure cups too. I don't use the heated cups as much. And then, you know, position the patient um, on their side and run the cup up and down the glute and the leg, and maybe even do cross channeling, cross fibering. So, you know, uh, that's, that's sort of something that would be more within what um, I was trained to do, but what you described sounds really awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, we're, I'm always looking for ways as a, to not have to use my hands to dig into all the painful spots. When you start seeing, well, all of you guys know, I'm sure out there, but you, when you start seeing a lot of patients, a lot of in a row on a day, 
over weeks and months, you need to find ways that it's not always you and your body doing all the work. So fascial work, I find manual fascial work is takes a lot out of me as a, as a professional. Um, and so finding ways to not have to do it with my own hands and using cupping, using the Pilates repertoire. I mean, one of the best, I think, exercises to open up fascial planes is push through on the Cadillac, for example, would be that whole posterior chain getting stretched. Or we have a lot of those exercises in the Pilates repertoire that do put that fascia on stretch. Um, so finding ways where they get to do the work and I get to coach them through the work helps helps them, but it helps me not also have to always dig in and use my body and hands to do all that work. So that's why <laughs> it's such a great tool. Plus, I think the difference, if for those of you who know more about manual work, the difference between cupping or myofascial, we, which is why we call it myofascial decompression versus manual work or massage work or all of that is actually compression work. If I dig into somebody with my hands or put pressure, I'm actually compressing the structure. Whereas with the cupping, we're pulling away, stretching by pulling away. So it's a different approach uh, to, to a manual work or to body work. Uh, the opposite approach, which is kind of nice sometimes if somebody's really not moving in the right direction with massage or manual work or physical therapy, then switching the approach on the body sometimes makes the body go, oh, maybe I am supposed to bring more blood flow to this area. Maybe I can release if I get pulled, if I get stretched in this direction, but stretching by pushing is not working because there's too many other sore structures underneath sometimes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to that's that, another. To that, yeah, to that point about working, you know, working a lot, the other modality that is really used in um, musculoskeletal with acupuncture is electro electroacupuncture. So hooking the needles up to um, the electrical unit. Um, and that I think was created just because instead of standing there and stimulating dig, 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 like super, you know, the Classically, the acupuncture needles could have been rotated, I don't know, uh, 300 times in, in one minute or something. This, um, this tends to give a stronger stimulation. It's not necessarily any more uncomfortable. It's actually sometimes more comfortable. And that tends to override the contraction of either stimulate the muscle or if the muscle is extremely contracted, like you were saying, and if you're trying to work on something that's not working, sometimes the electro uh, stimulation on an area that's very, very um, congested and tight and just won't release, having that override the muscle to do regular contraction and, and relaxation will um, increase the blood flow and uh, save a lot of time with acupuncturists rather than, you know, just manipulating, um, by hand. So, yeah. Great. Well, I'd love to know if any of you guys have also had any experience having acupuncture yourself or clients that have had acupuncture or even any questions about clients that uh, you're wondering if it might be worth sending them in the direction of acupuncture as a conjunctive treatment. Um, I've had acupuncture, uh, for a while I was seeing an acupuncturist, um, fairly regularly, um, for low back pain. Um, and I had good experiences and bad experiences. <laughs> um, the good times I would just literally fall asleep on the table. And I think I woke myself up snoring once or twice. <laughs> um, like that's how like relaxed it made me, which was really nice. Um, but I did have a couple times where it was the, the twisting, um, sent my back into spasm. Mm. Um, and I'm curious what your, uh, you know, I, I assume maybe it was just too much. I was a little too sensitive or something. And it was, you know, mine is very much a muscular, I, I'm saying that you can speak to it a little bit more probably <laughs> what, what's going on with me, but, um, muscular fascial, just tightness yeah, and, and, just block and spasm. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, and I, I apologize. I missed the, the first part of um, 
the session today. So I, I probably missed a chunk of your explanation of how all of that works. Um, but if, the, if you can bring up anything new from that. Sure. Did you want to talk, Zaina? Or? Um, no, I, I have had the privilege of not only working with Genevieve, but she's given me the privilege of working on her body a lot. And so what, what has happened after series, sorry, Genevieve, you're okay with me explaining a little bit. Yeah, okay. So what has happened after a few car accidents on a hypermobile body um, and you know, a slight scoliosis, very slight, but there are scoliosis happening. Her one side of her back tends to end up in spasm a lot and, and grab. So she gets a little rotated in the vertebra, she gets a little facet joint congestion, and then everything goes into a, a big spasm. And it can sometimes take very little. So she's been working on it for a very long time, trying to get things to calm down and we'll have some great success for a while. And then be she'll do one thing and it'll just trigger again and she'll go back into the spasming, which is just a locking. Basically the muscles lock everything around locks and she gets stuck in di different degrees. Um, and so it's muscular and fascial. And I think a little facet joint as well happening when she gets really extremely locked, but I can imagine that I, I'm going to speak for you now, Leila and Genevieve, but I can imagine that she gets hypersensitive. Like she's very sensitive. So I'm wondering if that maybe what you said, Genevieve, about too much stimulation for a sensitive body might have been the case, but I'll let you speak to that, Leila, a little bit. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like uh, in your case, Genevieve, there was, um, I guess, multiple ways that that this could sort of flare up or or spasm again. Um, and yes, definitely. I mean, that's that's one of the things that I think we, we have to pay attention to, but, um, it's a, it's a very common thing to see somebody being too sensitive. Um, it's actually more common, I think, than I think people kind of block things off and don't realize that what, what could be, what could be happening. I think, um, for example, um, somebody who's too, who, and too sensitive is a, is a term, but somebody who has an acute awareness of everything going on in their body or can really tell when something, they might be in a more stressed stress position in that sort of um, sympathetic mode of fight and flight rather than the rest and digest. So um, if I were working with somebody and they said, look, you know, I spasm up really fast or there's something that could be triggered, um, then I would say, well, you know, let's not work on that area. Let's work distally. Let's, um, because you can work distally actually and affect, as we were talking about on fascial planes, you can't, let's work distally and let's really work on um, maybe rebalancing that parasympathetic uh, and sympathetic nervous systems. And that sounds to me, um, Genevieve, based on what you were saying that you, when it was good, you, you conked out. Well, that's, that's the rest and digest in full uh, action right there where you're actually able to um, allow your body to rest. And so multiple times of that could probably then in working with movement theory, like this, this is a great example actually, Zaina, of where um, movement therapy maybe before, I mean, in an ideal world, if you've got everybody underhand and you wanna just do it perfectly and time and is no issue, you could do, a little bit of um, uh, uh, some acupuncture and then maybe go into working on Genevieve's um, uh, you know, tight back area with some slow stretching movement. So you're kind of reinforcing, you, you're already in this relaxed state and then you go in to kind of tell the muscles, hey, let's move in this relaxed way to kind of keep that. That's a really good way to do it. Or you could do your movement therapy it went well, and then go to acupuncture, kind of um, get into that rest and digest state. And then it's like reinforcing what you just did is good and we're staying that way. So that's a really good example of how those two can, can be working together. Great. Yeah. Anyone 
Thank you both. Anyone else with experience or clients that have had experience? Otherwise, I'm going to ask another question because I like asking questions. So Layla, I'm not sure if this is even in the scope, but I'm just going to throw it out there. So you feel free to throw it back and say, no, I don't want to answer that. But if um, there's a lot, in, there's been a lot in the media and in the news about turmeric. And yeah. um, I'm curious to know, and then there's also the curcumin, I believe it is, that people yeah. have now extracted from turmeric um, for anti-inflammatory. Um, and I'm wondering if you know about that or can give us any information about that at all. Um, sure. I mean, it is one of the, the Chinese herbs that's used. It isn't, it's an ancient herb. Um, and I'm very glad that, that we're having, you know, that sort of in our world now that there's access to this. Um, I, we just have to pay attention to what are the, what are the other things that it does? It does reduce inflammation, but it tends to be, um, a little bit tricky for a few people with, who might have, um, some, uh, gastric issues. If there's, it can, it can, you know, depending on what you're taking and what kind of supplement it could, there could be some, uh, reflux. Um, I think it's a wonderful tool to use to, to help as just a general anti-inflammatory. Um, I use different, um, herbals if I'm actually targeting a specific area. Right. Um, but I would say, um, the curcumin, um, extract, I think that they have to make sure it has the certain properties that you can then, um, take and uh, benefit from. I would say using the good quality supplements, perhaps, you know, ensuring that what you buy is really what you're getting is, is, is key. Um, I think that there are some blood, uh, blood thinning properties that maybe a few elderly people might, you know, prone to blood clots or if they're already on aspirin or something like that might want to pay attention. So as with anything, it can be really great. And then it could be not so great. Um, so depending on how, how things are going. Um, I also know for general inflammation, um, fish oil, uh, also thins the blood a little bit or could potentially thin the blood, but, um, high quality fish oil, they're, they're finding more and more ways of fractionating the fish oils so that it can be taking just the anti-inflammatory, um, oils and putting those in. And that's actually a really great, uh, great modality too. I have to say, for example, um, I was, I had my second dose of the vaccine of the Pfizer vaccine and I had back pain and low back pain. And I also had a bunch of other things and I didn't really want to take a, um, any sort of anti, you know, the non-steroid anti-inflammatories. I wasn't, but I did want to feel okay. And I said, after day two, I said, well, it's, I'm still feeling a little achy. I took some of the fractionated fish oil and uh, after a few doses, it really felt better. Um, so yeah, there's, there's ways uh, and things to take, but yeah, turmeric is great. What about you? Do you use that? I, um, I've used turmeric in the past, but I get a lot of questions about should I, shouldn't I, I get, a, I get, I think more because of the physical therapy side, I get a lot of questions about well, I don't really like to take anti-inflammatories. I've been on them too long. I want to come up. And they, they're they always asking me, what do you think about turmeric? What do you think about? And I think there was some studies. I don't know. I could be wrong. And I don't have the resource on this, but that we're showing that too much of the extracted anti-inflammatory from the turmeric can cause other problems. Maybe they're, we're speaking to gastrointestinal type issues. I, I really don't remember. Um, but so people are always asking me for that advice. I, I'm not licensed to give that advice as a physical therapist in California. Uh, I'm only licensed to tell them here's, here's some information, but you sure. should really ask your doctor or, 
but um, I have used it and I think that it's actually been helpful for my own body. Um, so, but I, I agree. I think it has to be, I think quality really matters of yeah. the supplement. Yeah. So. My father, my father um, was taking too much turmeric and his labs were not as normal as they should have been. And once he stopped taking the two doses, you know, sometimes people just think, and, and, you know, it's like, oh, well, if I take one, then two will even be more anti-inflammatory, but, you know, you do have to, and he was getting a little bit, um, extra zealous about, I really want to reduce inflammation reason. And, uh, he was having a little bit of extra bruising, um, mm-hmm. and just, uh, he was, he was having gastric problems. And so that, that was, um, that was one thing I, I know it's not anti-inflammatory, but, um, I wanted to ask you, I see in this, the, the studio, the, the collagen and, um, and, so I know you weren't expecting me to ask you a question, but if I could, <laughs> I would love to hear what you feel about the collagen and, you know, how that works on, on people's mobility or joints or. Yeah. Um, I don't know enough. I wish I knew more about it, or I wish I had more studies to tell me more about it. Mm-hmm. Um, what we, what we do know is that it's supposed to strengthen cartilages and, um, also for skin. So layers of, um, the tissues that we have in our body. So skin layers, cartilage layers, ligamentous, um, structures, th- that's the idea. Um, there is no research that I've seen that has any negative effects. So a lot of clients are asking about, should I, can I try collagen? Um, So as far as I know, there are no studies that show any detrimental or bad effects or side effects that could be dangerous or harmful in any way. And um, it seems that there are some studies coming up that are showing that it can be helpful for everything from skin and hair to um, ligaments and cartilages. So I think I, uh, my opinion right now is that there's a lot more research that needs to be done, but because it's not harmful and seems to be helping uh, and people wanted a pure form, formula of the collagen, um, easily accessible. We got a lot of requests and questions about it. And that's how we ended up having the one that we have. Well, I, yeah. I think it's really great. And I really I really do love collagen. And I think here's a really interesting way that you can talk, we can talk about how even collagen could be anti-inflammatory um, and helpful for, you know, musculoskeletal and whole body health is that um, just like bone broth, um, collagen is a gut healer. And so regular intake of bone broth or collagen, um, and they're not exactly replaceable, but they, they do have the same properties of, of gut healing, um, healing the gut. And a lot of people have inflammation if they're, if their digestion isn't right and their gut isn't right. And the, the sort of, uh, leaky gut syndrome where what you eat creates inflammation in your body because your gut may have patches where it's letting the food go through and getting into the bloodstream. I mean, in very molecular, small molecular portions, but, you know, regular intake of something like collagen helping to improve the gut, then your guts improved. You're not having that overall inflammation entering your body. It is in a sense, a roundabout way for being anti-inflammatory. So Yeah, I think it's a really good, um, really good thing to take. And I have not heard of any um, like contraindications for, Mm -hmm. for that, as long as the quality is good. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, I can't believe, but we're running out of time. So I just wanted to thank you so much, Leila, for doing this. And she did it on pretty short notice, but I'm so grateful that you could do it and share with us. Um, and if you guys want to have more information or get in touch with Layla, you can always send me a message through our link, either Facebook or LinkedIn that we have. Um, and I can definitely get you in touch with Layla that way. Uh, so please feel free to ask questions. 
Um, I thank you guys all for taking the time to be here. We love having people coming into our rounds and sharing ideas and thoughts. And we're working on our list of uh, great guests to have come in to share more with us about different topics that can relate to our movement therapy that we're doing. So please spread the word if you're interested or if you know other people who are interested in joining, we'd love to have them. And then just to let you know that at Synergy Plus, we have been working really hard to create, um, to, to educate ourselves all the time. And we put together a rehab certification course that's actually starting on the 12th of May. Uh, it's a module that goes through about eight, eight modules that covers all the different parts of the body. And we talk about issues that people could have, syndromes most commonly seen in clinic and in the studio and talk about contraindications and how you can progress them into the best practice of movement therapy. So if you're interested in that, I can actually post the link um, in the chat and you can get right to the, to our, just kind of our website and check it out. And you can also sign up there to have a discovery visit so that we can talk about it more. And please feel free to pass it on to anyone who might be interested in that as well. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Again, if you want to get more information, you can always reach out to me and I'll get you in touch with Layla. And um, hopefully we'll see you again next week. So thanks so much, Layla. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much, Layla. Thanks, Layla. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you yeah, for being here. That's great. Okay. Have a good afternoon or well evening. Done, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you for being here. <laughs>